I much prefer the sharpest criticism of a single intelligent man to the thoughtless approval of the masses. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your hosts here in Birmingham, England, Matt and George Russell. Oh yeah, baby, Kepler. You're Alice Kepler. Born on this day, George. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. The 27th of December. I know we're recording this on Christmas Day and you're looking very confused at me. <laughs> but uh, this comes out on the 27th, George. Okay, yes, yes. so this day is an asterisk there. <laughs> yeah, asterisks are, are, are born on this day. <laughs> Just to, you know, Isaac Newton was apparently born on Christmas Day. Or was Apparent, it New Year's how, Day? Surely that should be like... No one really well established. knows. I guess the weird thing about dates is they haven't really yeah, been standardised. Exactly, exactly. With it, exactly. No one really knows. It became a complete mess. So who really knows when yeah, people Yeah, leap years and stuff were only yeah. really properly defined. Just sort of. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. it's dates. Kind. Yeah, yeah, no, it doesn't, yeah, really, it doesn't really matter, George. Really? No, 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 no. Right, so George, I thought we'd have a quick rundown of the really cool events that have happened this year. What do you think? Just and, the, I, and I've categorised them into different kind of categories but my what i want to do is start with my favorite space event of the year which was what do you think i think it was probably the launch of the james webb telescope the james <laughs> webb telescoping yes i think it probably was that uh we, we we've just watched it in fact if you exactly if, yeah, yeah because it is in fact christmas, christmas day. day yeah uh yes it was enjoyable wasn't it in fact it was couldn't i don't think i've seen such a smooth launch as that um what about uh Saturn V, oh, uh, sort of 1972. Oh, well, no, 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 it wasn't. But Falcon 9 in 2012. That was a good yeah, one. that was a good one, yes, no. But I think that was a very smooth launch. It all seemed to, there, there was no holds. It was like bing, bang, bosh, everything went to the... Didn't everything... the, um, the, the solar panel deploy a bit too early? Yeah, that was a bit of a scary moment because you heard a lot of chitter-chatter in the background and I thought, oh, no, something's gone wrong. But then I think that chitter chatter was all about the James Webb Telescope uh, not only having legs but having power, its own power. Right. So, 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 what was the talk of the? the there was there was no problem. There. I I don't know. I do you know I haven't looked into it any further. But everything up till there, and what I loved about the deployment of the James Webb Telescope itself, because I wasn't expecting a camera, is it looked like someone putting a turkey into the oven. Yeah, it was. It's like it's covered in that tin foil it's kind like of massively tin foiled up. Yeah, it? yeah. So it does look like a, a bit like a sort of potato or something going into. Well, no. Well, I'd like to think of it as a Christmas turkey. Yeah, Christmas turkey because it was Christmas Day or a shell warmer. Yeah, I mean, maybe future historians in thousands of years' time will be really confused about why the James Webb Telescope was launched on Christmas Day. And they'll sort of think, maybe think that it was a religious event. I don't know. Uh, probably, probably well, well too documented. <laughs> well like, too documented. Ever since the internet, <laughs> historians have got a really easy job. But what I love about it is that we have talked possibly non-stop, I, I reckon virtually every episode for the last three years has referenced the stress of the James Webb Telescope launch. Oh, yeah, it's definitely going to be as big as Hubble. It's weird that no one's talking about it at all. Uh, I, I have to say, I'm very disappointed it's not... Like, it wasn't on national television as a kind of, here's the launch of the James Webb Telescope, that, that you'd think it would be a real opportunity for science outreach. Because, after all, we've... It's... As taxpayers, we've spent a lot of money on this thing. Even Britain, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah, not yeah. just a, like a NASA thing. No, right? no, it's NASA, ESA, uh, and and thousands of scientists all around the world who are being financed by taxpayers. Yeah, I mean, it's it's and lots of other universities and things like that. so. But it's 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 big, isn't it? But but the, the fact is that launch that we've talked about for you know pretty much every episode for the last however many episodes are on, 269 episodes. We've talked about the stress of the James Webb Telescope launch, and it's done. It's finally over. It's finally over. Ariane 5. Brexit. Yeah, well done, Ariane 5, for actually one of your very final launches, launching one of the most, one of the most amazing pieces of engineering ever. So the next few weeks are going to be stressful as it works its way over to its Lagrange point. The and Lagrange. slow Lagrange point. Which, which Lagrange is that? I think it's L2, isn't it? Probably. Um, yes. Well, it's one of those ones where it can stay the other side of the moon, be shielded from the Earth, 
uh, radio waves and shielded from the sun and just look out into space as it's, cold as possible. It's a, it's a million kilometres away from the Earth. Yeah, it's a very long way. Well, that's like insanely... <laughs> like, if you think of like uh, orbit in space, that's quite a vague place. Like, you can think of low Earth orbit and that's only 100, 100 kilometres, right? Right, well, but it's between 100 kilometres and... About 500 kilometers, yeah, 600 kilometers, 700 that's kilometers. That's like, yeah. it's really close. It's barely mm. out of the atmosphere. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then you've, a million. you've got, yeah, it's, it's a you've long got way like out. geostationary <laughs> orbits, which are... Oh, well, the moon's only 250,000 miles away. That's that's further than geostationary, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, much further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got the, yeah, so you've got geostationary. Well, obviously, because just... if the moon wasn't... If... If the moon wasn't further out than geostationary, it would just be in the same place all the time. It'd be really annoying. Well, that was only if it was <laughs> exactly at geostationary orbit. Yeah, but it would have a very slow. It would like lunar months would be very long. Yeah, I'm working out now that the 28 lunar <laughs> lunar calendar, 28 days of the lunar calendar, that mm. does suggest that it's suggested, nearer. Yeah, yeah. That it's nearer. I oh, know it's much further it's out much than further, further yeah. out than uh, geostationary. 28 times. But yes, the James Webb Space Telescope is so far out. If there's something wrong with it, we are never gonna fix it. Well, maybe not. Well, no, it, we've, it, we're not. I've, the amount of people I've spoken to. Uh, fixing it is just completely out of the uh, out of the question. It's it's going to have to be yeah, replaced. Even star even Starship going to the moon isn't even as that far. And by the way, Starship can use the slink like the moon's gravity to yeah. get back, but not like, from there. It not, no, 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 no. You literally have to dip into into stellar into yeah. planetary And have you space. seen how many launches of Starship you have to make just to go to the moon? Because Jeff Bezos did that uh, like poster that was supposed to frighten everyone about how ridiculous it was. It's it's ridiculous, basically. So it's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, so I think that's my event of the year, the launch of the James Woods. We've waited for it for absolutely ages. It's happened, and it happened beautifully, smoothly, cleanly. Done. I think it's job done. Congratulations to everyone at ESA for all that hard work. Well, that was truly inspirational now uh, what i think we should talk about in next is rockets themselves we'll get onto some sciencey stuff but rockets a very unscientific topic well well it's more engineering isn't it Suppose, rockets it's more a engineering branch of science i guess no a branch of science where gravity is 10 pi is 3 <laughs> and the sine of x is x <laughs> exactly it's not science it's engineering <laughs> but well i mean yes obviously Rocket engineers use science to make rockets. Yeah, yeah, but but, but scientists use maths. I don't know. Obviously, they, it's it's on us. It's on some kind of um, spectrum. Really, maybe. Uh, the roses are and... sweet, no matter what name you call it. And so. That's exactly that's exactly right, George. Very very well. I mean, they're, they're obviously this this year was carrying on the trend of smaller rockets being developed, but on the absolute other end of the scale. I would say that the big story of the year is what in rocketry, do you think, for me? Probably going to be Starship. Starship, yeah. Well, not just for you, but it's very hard to pick another thing. I guess Jeff Bezos' uh, thing, you know. <laughs> Jeff <laughs> Bezos' thing. Setting himself to space. Yeah, no, but we'll get on to that because that's I'm gonna that's going to be in my human exploration but section. That's nothing for a rocket. That's like I, that's like less than what we were well, doing it, in the 50s, you know? Well, yeah, exactly. So, but it, it, well, I mean, it's it's sort of Gemini type thing, isn't it? It's like yeah, it's it's not, literally yeah, like yeah, a yeah, kind yeah. of it's not, it's toy. It's, it's basically a well, plane. It's, well, in fact, it's called New Shepard after Alan Shepard. It's it's no better than that from mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which is early 60s. Well, anyway. Starship, right? Let's let's get a bit of a timeline for this year. We had SN nine in in on the second of February, so that was it. Did a it, it did a massive um, flight, came back down and, and blew up on the uh, <laughs> launch pad. Um, so that was SN eight and SN nine. Uh, um, SN eight was last in the previous year, but SN nine. Did a very similar flight, blew up, uh, get got the FFA very FAA hot under the collar. We actually interviewed someone from FAA as well. It was worth going back to that podcast. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, obviously there's been I, I, well, there's no point going into it because there's a lot of video footage and lots of people on you know Marcus House and all those people and everyday astronaut all those people that talk a lot Scott Manley Scott Manley talk a lot about what's happening down at Boca Chica 
Boca Chica Village and and star base. Yeah, I imagine and, and every astronaut's already at there talking to Elon Musk now, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's lots of stuff going on, all these test stands and stuff that's being built. But the big one was, I guess, Starship SN11 blew up after it went in thick flog. Remember that one? Yep. That was a pretty good one. Uh, SN10, uh, before that, had blown up. That's the 3rd of March. Then SN11, um, on the 30th of March, I think that was, that that was in fog, and it was like really annoying. It was like Elon Musk not following his kind of usual thing of making it as watchable as possible. It was like, oh, something's gone up in the air and it's blown up and no one really knew what happened. But then gloriously, um, uh, we had SN15. So SN12, 13 and 14 were, were not ever fully assembled if you wondered what happened to them. But SN15, 5th of May, 2021, uh, landed and completed the first successful mission. So it landed... Nothing terrible happened, and that was it. We had the first successful landing of a starship. Now, mm-hmm. George, let me ask you a question. When you watch those manoeuvres, yeah. the belly flop... The belly, yeah, the classic. And all those explosions getting to, uh, of course, SN15, did it make you confident that we're going to see people on a starship anytime soon? Well... <laughs> Of of all the like space related like rockets like videos of rockets the the belly flop maneuver when it when it was successful and even when it it blew up you know when it landed yeah, and then yeah. exploded afterwards mm. it's like one of the it's one of the most like film it looks like a film like a yeah. movie almost, yeah you know yeah I, look, I mean it looks crazy it looks absolutely crazy but would you do it would would I do it would you get in would, there would I'd you get, get in? in yeah would you get well, in it's probably a one way trip to 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 the to Mars on that thing. If if it is you being used for for Mars flight, like it was. Well, what promised. about the moon? What about what about this like trip? a slingshot? What about the, what about this trip to the moon yeah. that, that uh, your old Japanese dude's going to do? What was his name? The 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 dear moon guy. Yeah, dear moon guy. We'll get onto him later. But what was you know? Are you would you be confident coming back to Earth for, with the belly flop maneuver? I guess it's it's one of those things where you can't really use your intuition. Well, I'm your intuition's go, uh, sort nah, of based around my like, intuition is that. That we are a decade away from humans traveling. No, on but a I mean, like, think about like the, like the commercial that, anyway. airliner. Like, if you if you were to say to somebody in the twenties, you know, do you would you trust? Yeah, exactly. But it took decades for people because because there was lots of accidents. they were very yeah. dangerous. At they the were start. very yeah. dangerous at the start. But I think these are more dangerous, and I think it'll take longer to to to, to iron out. I think you've got Rem, you've got the option. You can go up in a dragon capsule. And dock with Starship, go to the moon, re-dock with a dragon and come back in a much safer that method. That seems a lot safe. Why even bother with having the Starship land? Why not just have an orbital thing which stays in orbit? You, you dock to it on the dragon, mm. you land you're, with the dragon. You're opening up a bigger debate here. This is like, like having shuttles and... Yeah, yeah, just yeah. like having it a modular system having, where yeah, you... Yeah. It just—it uh, seems a bit cyclers, ridiculous. Yeah, cyclers, cyclers etc. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. I, well, I mean, I don't know. It's putting uh, all it, your eggs oh in one God, basket. This, this is in one very this is, this, precarious this, yes, basket. This, this has gone round and around and around. And of course, we've, we've, we've seen not only have we, I mean, watching what's happening in uh, Boca Chica has been amazing because since then they've been loading lots and lots of. Um, Raptor engines onto the bo- bottom of super heavies and stacking the Starship on top of the super heavy lifter and stuff. So it's really looking pretty amazing. And 2022 is going to be very, very cool if they do that orbital launch of a you know of a, yeah. of a Starship with a super heavy. It feels like Elon Musk time is always twice as long. No, no, but I think short. I think that will happen. I mean, it's been pretty rapid. That, it, um, that, that I mean, but, it's but only because of things like flying and flying. Like if you things. compare that to New Glenn, oh, it's yeah. just insane. New Glenn is on paper pretty much. Uh, yeah, nothing. well, it still is. Yeah, I mean, it just hasn't hasn't done it. He actually has built, you know, yeah, the Starship. He just needs to develop it further and fly it. Now, one interesting thing that was interesting and actually puts, I think this is worth noting. Is like everyone thinks that Elon Musk got this kind of bottomless pit of money to develop Starship. He actually wrote an internal email to all his employees saying oh, the leaked email, yeah, yeah, the, about ra- the Raptor yeah, the, disaster, yeah. The, so the Raptor engine production is just not mature enough 
for them to really create to, to to risk blowing up that many raptors all the time particularly with the super heavy which has loads on it's like 27 or something <laughs> yeah exactly it's got so you'd be losing 27 plus the six on the the yeah, other one and it's, it's just in, like uh, insane amounts of oh engines. yeah exactly so it's 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 crazy it's so in hundreds per launch or something well it's not no it's Ten, in the, it's, tens, it's, per it's, launch, it's yeah. tens per launch but it's like yeah it's in the 30s it's like losing you know well, 10 uh, or so Falcon. Well, exactly. Considering how expensive these things are, you can't do it. And of course, he wrote an internal email that said, well, look, we're in risk of bankrupting the company if, we, if, we, if, we, if we're not careful here. So it's not all, it's not plain sailing. It, it, it could easily screw up here. It only takes one little technical hurdle to completely derail this whole project. So even though it's the largest spacecraft ever built largest rocket ever built most powerful as well and the most powerful it still hasn't flown so at the moment it's in the category of n it's not even in the n1 n1 category. flew in yeah. fact the reason it flew makes it part of the uh list of the top top you know <laughs> 10 or so non-nuclear explosions yeah top biggest non-nuclear explosion yeah i think you won't believe number five (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) so yes i think uh that's been the most exciting story of the year is is really starship and i think that's obviously i mean it's an obvious choice isn't it that of course you can't not mention starship for 2021 yeah it's it's an obvious choice um now, I wanted to talk about Earth observation because I think that's something that space is very, very good at. And I think um, the thing that the big story, I think, for Earth observation, and there's lots of Earth observation stories, but I think the big one really is the IPCC um, report that came out, which was 6th of, which I believe was 6th of August 2021. And it's the first part of the 6th report that uh, comes out the first part being the physical science basis so um the ipcc is the intergovernmental panel on climate change if you're wondering what it stood for is that part of um you know the un or something yes or it's it part just... of, yes it's part right, of the united okay. nations um but uh, lots and lots of countries have signed up to it and really it's it's, it's basically saying uh it, it's looking at how bad the situation is with clim- the climate crisis now how Checking bad do you the... how bad do you think it is i think it's fine actually yeah <laughs> well you're wrong <laughs> <laughs> it's basically if you read this report it's it's really quite frightening right so this came out a total of 234 scientists from 66 countries uh, and obviously nasa and and ESA have had a lot of influence on these papers because a lot of this is is Earth observation satellites and the science that comes from that. And um, yes, and and so this is the first of the three working groups, the the science basis rather than impacts, adaption and vulnerability and the mitigation ones that come out later. So that's 234 scientists, 68 countries, uh, reports uh, built on 14,000 scientific papers Um <laughs> and that goes that gets condensed down to a 4000 page report that was then approved line by line by 195 governments <laughs> uh so this isn't messing around as a report and and really basically if we want to avoid uh, a bigger warming than 1.5 degrees centigrade or even 2 degrees centigrade we have to immediately cut greenhouse gas emissions, right? As in, cut we, as in completely stop. Well, it. as in to just yeah, get it down to zero as quickly as humanly possible. Um, and basically, you know that that is um, it's the starkest warning yet, as the Guardian put it, um, of of since the, te- the Mayan calendar. <laughs> yes, since the Mayan calendar <laughs> or uh, Judgment Day in various yes. Abrahamic religions. Uh, yes and the thing is really what it's saying is that climate change is now inevitable and irreversible which is pretty depressing isn't it really um but it's massively important and boris johnson he said um, today's report makes for sobering reading and it's clear that the next decade is uh, going to be pivotal to securing the future of our planet i hope today's report will be a wake-up call for the world to take action now before we meet in glasgow uh, for capital cop 26 
the critical COP26 summit. You read that too clearly to be a really to be ac- Boris, to yeah, be to an be Boris, representation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, yes. So, but so in other words, Boris saw that it was pretty bad. Um, so yes, we're already on the train, as it were, for irreversible and <laughs> and quite inevitable climate change, which is which. So well, anyway, the IPC lead author said. This report shows the closer we can keep to 1.5 degrees centigrade, the more desirable the climate will be for living in. And it shows we can only stay within 1.5 degrees C, but only just, only if we cut our emissions in the next decade. If we don't, by the time the next IPC report at the end of this decade, 1.5 C will be out of the window. So that's bad news. Really bad news. Yeah. So we really need, so. But I always think if you can, call. if if it's kind of proposed that it's possible to terraform Mars or even Venus or any kind of rocky planet which is close, <laughs> which is in the r- yeah. roughly the habitable zone, surely then it is possible, even if things get really bad, to terraform <laughs> to, to form, Earth. Yeah, exactly. In other words, terraforming a planet is just so far out of the reach of technical uh, capability of humans when we can't even slowly keep the climate we have. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Of course, it's like it's of men- course people who are proposing terraforming are taking into account the facts of Moore's law on pretty much all... Yes, OK. So, But, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the only thing is we're looking... We've had crises like this before where it looks like, oh, no, it's doom, until a technology comes along and, and we're, we're all OK. So it's not, it's not super depressing. There might be carbon capture technology. There's certainly lots of uh, clean energy... Ways of making clean energy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, like loads, loads of um, loads of uh, countries are switching quite heavily to, to yeah. clean energies. And yeah, so on. but I mean, but it, it all feels decades too late. I mean, it feels like scientists have been banging on about. Yeah, this but you for know what decades. they say, Dad. The best time to plant a tree is twenty years ago, but the that's second what... best time is, is now. Today. Is now exactly, and and that's exactly right. I think. Well done. Well said, George. Um. Uh. And now get this. Another little report that came out this year said that the climate had shifted the axis of Earth. How does that happen? <laughs> yeah. So a, a study this year came out and said that glacial melting due to global warming is likely the cause of a shift in the movement of Earth's poles that occurred in the 1990s. <laughs> And that was published in March 2022. So melting glaciers have redistributed enough water to cause the direction of polar wonder to turn and accelerate eastward during the mid-1990s. So the whole axis of Earth has actually slightly shifted over because of the melting ice has kind of created this sloshing water effect. Isn't that crazy? That is quite crazy. How much in degrees is that? I don't know. I'm, and I'm sure not talking about thermal absolute, degrees. I'm, I'm yes, t- I'm talking. Yeah, you're talking about axial shift. <laughs> degrees, I actually yeah. don't know what the actual shift is, but it it must be minuscule. Or else oh, of we, course, yeah. But but still, but it, it does move around. <laughs> if any, it's measurable. That's it, pretty. It does scary. move around anyway. As yeah, in, as in like the, the but it's accelerated. The actual yeah. magnetic axis is usually. I, I think has been moving north since it's been recorded. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it, but it, it's also yeah, but the east. magnetic. It, it, but the actual axis itself hasn't. Oh yeah, the, the, the actual tilt. Yeah, the tilt itself. So has more or less stayed stationary. Yeah, but but it's it's not because of climate change which is like that i didn't is that is that state is that moving are you saying it's moving relative to the so to the solar system's plane yeah or okay so it's not so the the actual object the north pole is it's, it's, it's shifted a bit because of the sloshing around no no it's still it's still relatively there comp- like you don't we don't have to read the magnetic it. north pole is yeah no 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 the um the actual geom- geometric pole. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, but is, I, that, is that still in the same place? If you oh, drew an no. X on the ground, yeah, I guess so. Yes, I guess so. But it's like the stars in the sky have yeah, moved. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is crazy. So if you took a photo like twenty years ago <laughs> of the sky I at the same it, time, yeah. could you see the stars oh, just I don't shift know. a little? Oh, bit? I don't know. Just that because of the make. sloshing of water. I wonder. I wonder. I'm, I'm going to have to look into Will that it? story deep, more deeply. Yeah, but, and, but, but it's and it probably affects seasons somewhat. Yeah, I might. I might look deeper into that story for another podcast episode because I think that's absolutely it seems bigger amazing. than just like a quick mention. You know? Yes. Well, I know I'd not seen it before until I was looking at uh, today's top stories, and I thought, wow. Climate change is my big Earth observation story of the year. I think we, the, 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 it's come home to roost, hasn't it, the old climate change? Here's my Earth observation. Dad, have you noticed we're on a like a rock 
just literally hurtling through the void. Yeah, who noticed? Slightly covered in a, in a thin film of green and blue and a tiny atmosphere, and we're just hurtling through the void. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty scary, isn't it? That's, really? that's my Earth observation. That's your Earth observation. That's a very good one. Um, yes, well, uh, here's, here's, here's a really cool story that uh, I didn't cover at the time, but I did read about it at the time. Uh, in February, on the 28th of February, no less... Uh, there was a thousand reports in this country of, of strange streaking lights across the sky. And the UK Fireball Alliance, <laughs> yes, there is such a thing, that they've got cameras set up to see fireballs, uh, you know, i.e. meteorites and, and, and meteors. And so forth. And so forth, <laughs> coming into the atmosphere. And so they using this network of cameras, worked out where the landing site of this streaking meteorite would be. This could be a good way to prospect for gold. Like, if you had a set a system set up like that, you could quickly run towards, you know, the, the crash points of asteroids and yeah, but that's right. Them. That's exactly what they do do. That's, what, that's exactly what I'm explaining. <laughs> so the, the meteorite, it's at the first of its kind discovered for 30 years in the UK, uh, is a primitive carbonaceous chondrite which as you know george is a very rare type of um uh meteorite i thought you were going to say alien egg no it's well it is well in in a way it is an alien egg because it it's 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 the egg of the birth of the birth of the solar system wow that's deep it is a bit deep because yeah so it's it's essentially unaltered material from the formation of the solar system. And it's absolutely pristine, this meteorite, apparently. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, Japan and America did their Osiris Rex and and Hayabusa missions mm -hmm. in, in the wrong order there, but there we go. That's how I that's how I roll. Um <laughs> <laughs> Let's see the, the concept of time. Yeah, to bring to bring back, you know, these pristine bits of rock. Whereas the UK just collect it like flying in, in the sky. <laughs> So we so we've got this you know basically we've had like a this this thing delivered to us this pristine meteorite delivered to us from the early building blocks of the um of the solar system now this rock apparently comes out from near Jupiter's orbit and contains water and ice and and it's got a chemical makeup similar to the sun isn't that funny well just like so, hydrogen and helium and stuff. Well, no, but the sun's got metals in it. Oh right, uh, which, right. which obviously give so, it its spectrum, and 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 that is, and this this rock so this is made. This rock of similar is stuff. made of what if if you were to take all the hydrogen and helium out of the no, sun? Well, if you were to take the if you were to take the dust cloud that formed the sun, it's essentially made from the same dust cloud, basically. So it's, it's what is dust... that? What is that material called? That that comp like that mixture? Dust. No, no, like not not the um the way that the substance is, is is the form that it's in. I mean, like the actual substance itself. It's it's called a carbonaceous chondrite. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, so it you know how how cool is that? Uh, and the good thing about that is that Lucy, remember that it was a mission that was launched this year, and that so that's going off to those objects that are out by Jupiter, that Jupiter's Trojans. So Lucy's going off to uh, investigate. So it might be that we we see those Trojans are made of similar stuff to this meteorite that landed in in the UK, which I thought was really cool. Nice. Other stuff that's happened that was curious in the far far out. Far far out. That was a good. That was a good little story. So yeah, what do you know about far far out? Well, it's a centaur. Um... In our solar system, and not a uh, mythical beast which guards a labyrinth, yeah, but actually a object, usually in a kind of elliptical orbit, which at some point passes uh, in between the gas giants. Oh, does it? I didn't realise that it passed in between the gas giants. It's it's sub sub -net Neptune, yeah. Oh, I didn't realise that. I just thought it must be out in the Kuiper Belt. No, no, no. Out. So its its highest point is even further like so far mm. you could you could name it after how far its highest point is it's because it's, it's far far out. it's perihelion yeah. uh it's, high, its highest point in the sun but then uh, if when it comes Ap in aphelion it's 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 closer than neptune it's, and you're, it's you're, closer you're, than neptune yeah, yeah oh wow i didn't know that and could its orbit being could it could it be one of those objects that's, that are being perturbed by by this mysterious planet eight 
Probably. I, the, I didn't see that one when I briefly yeah. read the well, I don't Wikipedia think, yeah, article. I, yeah, so. I mean, I didn't realise that. But yes, this, this thing was confirmed in February the 10th to be the furthest object in the solar system. And it's been designated 2018 AG 37 because it was actually discovered in January 2018, but confirmed in February the 10th, 2021, to be officially the furthest object in the solar system so far. Yeah, and it will be considered a dwarf planet because it is big enough to be be one, only if they can see its progress meet what, you know what will be considered an orbit yeah because if it is just out that far it could just be being launched really yeah. well it well i suppose it could just be a wanderer the wandering through yeah the a bit like a, a moa moa or... yeah moa moa or borisov oh borisov was confirmed to be probably the most pristine comet ever to go through the solar system as how well. is pristine defined pris- well pristine? as in it hasn't it hasn't been near another sun it hasn't been near another star and so, so therefore, there. yeah, so it hasn't been affected by that star's solar wind. So as it comes in, it's literally pristine cometry. Where did it come from then? Well, I don't know. Don't know. Because surely it must have come from a star. That's how Not necessarily. material, mm-hmm. except from... Because when the universe started, it was all just protons, <laughs> neutrons, and yes, electrons. Yes, I know, and, but, it, but it doesn't have... Yes. And then they mm-hmm. get together. Yeah, and then that blows make up. Make hydrogen, yeah, yeah, yeah. make stars. Stars blow up, make new stars. Mm-hmm. They blow up, make mm-hmm. even more cooler yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> Yeah, so you're right. It's made of water. Maybe it's made of icy material. So it must have come from a star, yeah, originally. yeah, yeah. But it hasn't. But it, but it itself has no, the comet itself has never orbited another star, so it's pristine. I don't know much about the story. It's something I I, I saw. Um, the other little story I thought was worth mentioning, George. Did you hear about the mystery hut on the far side of the moon? Jabba the hut. No, not Jabba the hut. Just a mystery hut. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mystery hut. So U two two, which is the rover that landed on the far side of the moon, that that was wandering around in the von Karman crater on the far side of the moon, and on January the third, two thousand and nineteen, no, December the third, two twenty twenty one, it um it it took a picture of a cube shaped object on the horizon, nicknamed. The mystery hut because it does look it honestly the photo it looks like someone's erected a hut it, on the, on the that's horizon. The sort of thing that would be in like the thumbnails of a video titled you know scariest things found on the moon by oh, NASA. Yeah, I know, undou- undoubtedly it's some form of photograph. That reminds artifact. me of reminds me of um that that rock on Mars that looks a bit like a man just at, like running or walking. Oh yeah 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 yeah. So you know. It's going to be something similar. It's going to be some form of photographical artifact. It could just be a rock. You know, m- huts are just like things. Yeah, it could be a square rock, uh, but I doubt it. Um, but that was interesting. I thought that was really interesting. Now, out in another galaxy, get this, George. Um, I'm talking exoplanets here. In a gal- in an exoplanet found in another galaxy. In an extra galactic exoplanet, yeah, not just an exoplanet, but an extra galactic exoplanet. That the first one ever was found. Surely it's this just year. taunting us because we can't even. There's no, no way we can. We'll leave never the galaxy. get there. Obviously, we'll never get there. <laughs> but uh, it's in my one of my favourites. If, if you're an astrophotographer, one of the best targets is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Everyone loves a bit of the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's one of Whirlpool. the <laughs> Whirlpool Galaxy. It's one of the most beautiful objects in the night sky. Very easy to take a picture of. If you've got a camera and a telescope, boom, you can take a picture of the Whirl- Whirlpool Galaxy. It's very, very cool. Now, what they used is the Chandra X-ray telescope. So instead of looking for the dip in just normal light, they li- looked for the dip in X-ray light. Ah, so they were looking at a neutron star or or a black hole. <laughs> they don't know, uh, and basically, there's a very bright X-ray source in uh, in the Whirlpool Galaxy, and it had a little dip in it as a Saturn, what they think is a Saturn-sized planet, moved in front of its this enormous or another star, for example. No, it would have, wouldn't have been another. If it was another star, there would have been an increase in brightness, right? Unless the thing behind it was brighter than this, like that mm, star. Yeah, but probably not at that distance. Or if uh, it, if the star didn't emit X rays, for example. Yeah. So, but but anyway, it's it's a, it's it's either a black hole pulling in gas from a closely uh, from a close binary star, so, so, so getting very very hot in X rays, 
Uh, so any yes, I mean it'll, it, it's going to take a long time for this to be confirmed because you've got to wait for an orbit of this Saturn-sized object to go back in front of this object to confirm it. But uh, and I suppose you've got to wait for it to go around a few times so that you can confirm that it is well, that's indeed it, that's an insane. orbit. If you think about the the scales here, yeah, you're thinking about a galaxy that's like just insane. This like <laughs> well, thousands of get light this. years. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Not even thousands of lights. So, so, so far, how far away do you think the, the, the furthest exoplanet discovered is, roughly? I mean, it's big. It's, it's these big numbers. It's about 3,000 light years, right? So all the exoplanets we've discovered are within 3,000 light years. That's within our own galaxy. That's right? within our own galaxy. Now, this one, guess how far away it is? A billion light years? No, 28 million light years. That's that is insane. That is, I mean, that. Well, it's I mean, it's a well, it's, twenty-eight it's, million. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's it's well, how many orders of magnitude is that? That's like ten to five, the nine. Well, it was four orders of magnitude further away, at least. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's so far away. It's 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 absolutely ridiculous. Uh, yeah, three thousand light years to twenty-eight million light years. That is yeah that that but. Yeah, if you think about that, that's that is really insane that yeah. we're we, we're looking in our own galaxy and that's already a feat. But to look in another galaxy, but I mean, how big is this galaxy then? If it's that far away and yet it's still visible in the night sky, with the tele, you know, well, it's massive. Fairly... Obviously, it's a galaxy with billions of stars in, so it's absolutely massive compared to our own, though. Is it? Uh, I, I'm not sure how big the whirlpool galaxy is compared to our own. I think it's similar sort of size, yes. But it's a uh, whirlpool galaxy is actually two galaxies that are actually slowly combining. And that's why it's got that world. It, it's actually got a, 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 it's got a galaxy that's kind of pulling the 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 whirlpool apart, and and so you've got this you've got this kind of beautiful shape. It's really a, it's a, it's a really you know anyone that knows the whirlpool galaxy, it's a beautiful beautiful uh, galaxy. Definitely worth going out and trying to take a photo if you're if you want to get into astrophotography. It's definitely one of the ones that I used to love going out and taking photos of. So yeah, it's going to take uh, seventy years at least to confirm this sighting but nevertheless that's pretty exciting isn't it that we that we may have found an exoplanet in another galaxy yeah and they're using x-rays to do it rather than than light that's pretty cool isn't it now the other story that i really like this year actually in exoplanets we we talked about it on podcast 252 was these new hyacian or Hycian planets, which are sort of mini Neptunes that are that are, have got hydrogen atmospheres and water oceans, like these massive uh, planets with the that potentially are very, very, very good for the search of for life. So if you want to go and have and a for listen. maybe a back like you know a planet which we could colonize, for example. Yeah, well, potentially, yeah. So that it could be very, very cool as a place to go reminds and, me a lot uh, of the video game subnautica i don't know if anyone's played it yeah but, you know. yeah that, that's a really good shout there yeah. but yeah that's a that's based on a planet yeah. entirely covered in water that's got you know life forms and stuff. Mm -hmm. so what was your space probe moment of the year george space probe moment probably the um various missions involving asteroids Really? So, like the Hayabusa and the yep. Well, that that they sort of happened the year before, I think. Really, apart from Osiris Rex, I suppose. But no, my 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 favourite probe, I guess, was all the ones that went to Mars. But especially, I mean, obviously, obviously, perseverance. obviously, perseverance was, was that already a probe once it's landed. <laughs> Well, like it's a, a robot. It's a robot, isn't it? A robot, but ingenuity. It's not anthropomorphized enough to be a robot. I guess it has an arm, but like. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it is a robotic. It's a robotic uh, rover. It has to look like a, a human or an animal. But to so be a perseverance. Robot. But obviously, the coolest thing this year in terms of that kind of exploration, robotic exploration, is ingenuity. The little helicopter that oh, travels oh, yeah, yeah. on the belly of the beast, on the belly of perseverance, and that's actually been flying around. Yeah, it is really flying around. To be fair, the 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 um the crane that they they used to land uh, the Curiosity and now the per Perseverance rover. I guess you can count that as the first flying thing technically, but it's it's Ingenuity is definitely the first sustained and kind of controlled yeah. flight. Yeah, 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 exactly. Especially um, with the propellers. Yeah, and so and so a lot of people have called it the Wright brothers moment on Mars. Oh, yeah, it's definitely akin to that. Yeah. Or, it, or whatever the first helicopter it, was, you know. Yeah, the first helicopter would probably be a better one, wouldn't it? But it's, you know, it's the first powered flight on Mars. 
Do you think it's weird that we've that in, on Mars humans have invented the rocket that like rocket um, propelled flying machines before we've invented helicopters? Oh yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah, that is a bit weird. But then Mars's atmosphere is not particularly helpful. For yeah, I always was skeptical at first when I heard heard yeah, that they were using yeah. blades because I was like. Mars uh, I has know. an atmosphere. Well, I, I remember you watching that Thunderfoot episode and him kind of belittling it until he worked, until he actually ran the numbers, and it's so close to being impossible. Yeah, yeah. But it's like no, it is actually possible to do it, and and he was sort of he was very skeptical, wasn't he? But uh, I'm pretty sure the video was mostly positive. But I, I just just on like intuition. Yeah, I even mean, no, on absolutely. Earth, on Earth, building a helicopter is really hard. You know, mm. <laughs> we've been doing it for for you know like decades, but it's still barely possible. Mm. But you've got you've got hundredth the atmosphere, and it helps that there's a third the gravity. But even still, it's like you're barely scraping the ability to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And don't forget, China and the United Arab Emirates also sent uh, probes to, to 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 Mars, and China join the club of being successfully landing on Mars and operating a, a, a Europe, rover on Europe there. Europe has still yet to achieve that, right? Yeah, Europe have landed a couple of things Crash using landed. litho braking <laughs> with Chaparelli, and they thought litho braking with uh, poor old Beagle too, but it turned out that it was just one last panel didn't quite open, and the most gutting thing ever. If you're, if you're, litho braking is the most based solution for landing. <laughs> Definitely, it's the base, very based. Um, right, so yeah, I mean, I think Mars. Obviously, it's, it was always going to be a, a bit of a year for Mars because it's one of those windows of opportunity for landing on Mars after last year's takeoff moment. So uh, yes, that was always going to be on the cards. But it's been, I have to say, the, the Ingenuity helicopters. Pr- I would have thought has been more successful than they thought it was going to be. It's one of those moments, isn't it? It's like they'll be always sending helicopters from now on to Mars with with, with the things that they send because yeah. they're very useful. But what about other flying machines like planes and so on? Because they're more they're more efficient, you know. Like with well, a sending big wing. like a sort of like a, a little drone into but, yeah, yeah but you know, like yeah, those but, high altitude but, NASA planes that run on solar power, like for a blimp or maybe blimps, blimps as well. Yeah, but maybe the atmosphere is all wrong for that. But mind you, it's all wrong for helicopters, isn't it? Because I suppose with blimp, the good advantage is you can have the hydrogen inside the blimp to well, be the same. Let's pressure. face it; they should be sending blimps to Venus. Oh, of course. If we're going to send blimps, because with them Venus, Venus you can you can safely fill it with hydrogen or even like air. And yeah, well, I mean, it's it. Uh, Venus is ideal, and the, but, the amount of up thrust you get is just insane because the atmosphere is so yeah, thick. Yeah, a helicopter on Venus is easy. Yeah, yeah, but a helicopter on you Titan, can, ooh, you can dragonfly. Fly. The thing about That's Titan and Venus is you can literally put a, like wings on your arms and fly and by just fly. flapping. Well, I don't think you can do that on Venus because gravity is too strong. I think you could probably glide around. You could get you could well, get you can, a fair Yeah, distance. actually, yeah, you could probably glide around, but you definitely couldn't take off. I don't take, think. Take off on Titan though is possible. Yeah, yeah, take off on Titan. Yeah, would, I mean that's the coolest thing, isn't it? Um, right. So astronauts. So this has definitely been, and we did kind of say this at the beginning of the year. This has definitely been the year of commercial space flight. So it kind of, we were hinting at, uh, Virgin Galactic had always been kind of hinting that they were going to try and be the first. And you, well, it, it was kind of a two horse race, but p- between Blue Origin and, and yeah, Virgin Yeah, the billionaire Galactic. space race. The billionaire space race. Although I think it's unfair that they compare it to the space race of, of yeah. the, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. You know, is, if if, if uh, the Saturn V is a car, then Virgin Galactic's like a tricycle. You yeah, know? Uh, yeah, exactly. But, but. It, well, no, I, th- I think this is like, a, I do think this is important. And, and it's already, I must admit, I can't believe how many people have gone into space this year. And uh, uh, like, it's happened quite a lot now. And I thought it was going to be a few flights, but there was basically the, the first one, the first big one was on the 11th of July, 2021, where Richard Branson and three other p- passengers went up uh, with, uh, with the two pilots, Fred and Dave McKay. So, in actual fact, that must be that flight, the 11th of July 2021, must be the first time that two Brits have gone into space simultaneously. That probably is true. Yeah, that's got to be Has true. Has someone right? from Devon or Cornwall ever gone to space? I don't know. It's basically, there's probably only <laughs> Londoners, right? <laughs> Londoners. Richard, Br- I don't know where Richard Branson's from, actually. Um, 
don't think he's a Londoner. Uh, but it's anyway, about, yeah. but and Dave McKay is obviously Scottish. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that uh, then about a week later, Jeff Bezos on the twentieth of July, um, uh, flew into space. <laughs> Which, which must have been. I mean, let's face it. That's so close, isn't it? That both those that both those systems basically came together weeks apart. Yeah, I think it's. Or kind was of, Richard Branson just taking a huge risk by doing what he did do? I think it's. Well, he's already done things like he's yes. done something more yeah. risky than go to space, like, like his balloon thing. Yeah, like when his... he jumped out and survived in the ocean for ages, that was crazy. I remember being a kid and watching that and going. Branson's crazy. So he has done lunatic stuff, yeah. But yeah, so for him that I guess he's got he's more of a daredevil than Bezos. Bezos obviously that the new shepherd is more mature as has been found out really because we haven't really seen many more flights of Virgin Galactic since then. When are we, when are we going to see the Zuck in space? <laughs> as soon as possible. Um, <laughs> where's his rocket? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, just he'll just come out with it. It, and it will cost one billion dollars. Uh, the Blue Origin second crewed suborbital flight occurred on the 13th of October, and for me, this is one of my favourites because it took old Bill Shatner up, one of my favouritest people of all time. What does he do? William Shatner was Captain Kirk on oh, Star Trek. Oh yeah, that is and actually really cool. It, it is. It is very cool. It is cool that the person that probably. William Shatner's probably more responsible for people getting into space and science than any other human on Earth, I would think. Mm, well, him and Gene Rodenberry. George, George Lucas. You know, and George his Lucas. Yeah, 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 yeah. They but... should send Mark Hamill to space. Give oh, him a free ticket. Yes, definitely. Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford. Yeah, and and uh, any of the you know, Jar Jar Binks. We need to send him to space. <laughs> send Jar Jar. We won't it won't bring him back. And a, yeah, a little <laughs> statue of Jar Jar Binks. Um, yeah, so William Shatner went into space. That I was really chuffed with that. I uh, so you know that's cool. That's that's really cool. Um, and Wally Funk actually on that first one. That was a very cool little uh, element of it. Uh, but the third flight had a full crew on, so that was six passengers. And that meant that at that point, there was 19 people in space. So that yeah. shows how much space has suddenly become this place to go. The most you, amount of people have, have ever been to space. That's the most amount of people in space over the 100-kilometre line at, that point, at any one point. How many people were in the Arctic? Ooh, that's a really good point. I mean, well, we, it's more than that. It's got to be more than that. But, but yeah, they it's it's probably getting close to the same amount yeah, yeah. of people in space as in the Arctic. How long yeah. will you take? Will it take before there's more people in space than the than the? Well, the not just Antarctic. that, but it's like not not in the tens. It's kind of in the consistent hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah, I think we're still a long way from hundreds. But yeah, there, so there was a bunch of people on the ISS: Mark van der Hei, Rajachari, Thomas Mashburn, Kyla Barron, Anton Skloberovich, Piotr Dubrovich, Alexander Mizurkin, and of course. We started the year with Matthias Mara being interviewed on the Interplanetary Podcast. He was up there at that point. You had your Yasuka Mizawa, Mazawa, the Mizawa, billionaire, the billionaire Yasuka Mazawa, and Yozo Hirano, who basically went up on a Soyuz um, as a trip to the ISS as a kind of checking space out before they do the dear moon project right yeah that is that guy's you know like it's a way to spend money if you're a billionaire <laughs> yeah that is quite a fun way yeah. to do it you know? so they're all they, they were all on the iss then you had the chiang gong uh space station which which of course has got jai jing jai Zhengang, wang yaping and yi gang gong fu if you check those uh pronunciations with Guanfu. No, I haven't checked. I must admit, I'm I'm very much uh, uh, winging it there. And of course, you had on New Shepherd, you had these six people, um, including Dylan Taylor and Lane Bess and Michael Strahan, Cameron Bess, Evan Dick, Laura, Laura Shepherd Churchley. So they they all went up on uh, New Shepherd. Um, uh, so yes, nineteen people in space at that point. So people from US, China, Russia, Germany, and Japan. Very cool. Nice. Uh, so yes, that that was the most amount of people in space at any one time. Um, of course, commercial space as well, as you, you having Blue Origin and uh, Virgin Galactic. You also, I think, have the much cooler system of SpaceX launching these 
um, Dragon capsules that go orbital. Remember, these are suborbital flights, the other two. So you've got Virgin Galactic, which is a space plane. You've got a capsule with Blue Origin that's, you know, like the early spacecraft that took Alan Shepard up. And then you've got SpaceX with, with a proper orbital vehicle going up on a mission, the Inspiration4 mission, taking a bunch of people up including the first black woman pilot, Sean Proctor, who was a geoscientist. She's 51, and she, she'd she actually almost become an astronaut herself, but didn't quite make the cut. And she'd be, she's and what done... What mission was that? Uh, this is in, uh, Inspiration4, this is. No, no, I mean, what mi- wish, mission did she... Not make the make, cut. No, but no, she cut. didn't make the cut as a NASA astronaut at all. Oh, just so generally. She almost got to, yeah, she, yeah so she got to the final... She was a finalist, but never actually got through to f- to become a full astronaut. Uh, but she has taken part in things like uh, isolation studies uh, in Hawaii and stuff like that on trips to Mars and things like that. So she's, you know, this is someone that's proper being a space nerd. And so she got her little trip to uh, to space, completely financed by the one guy that went up there um, with them all. Uh, again, uh, Jared Isaacman, uh, uh, he paid for it all. Privately financed this whole mission. Very expensive, much more expensive. Than How did he the... select the the people? That oh, were, were they just they, friends they, or something? Yeah, they were related to the hospital that he was raising money for, right. which was very very cool. I mean, it was you know it, it's. It, I actually think that that's that was the coolest one, you know. Even though obviously as a Brit, I'm kind of I'm rooting for Jeff uh, for old uh, Richard Dicky P- Dicky Pickles for <laughs> Dicky Pickles, but um, I, I I you know I I kind of have to give it to Elon Musk that that is pretty bang out to have an orbital. Um, I uh, think the plane, space tourism. the plane design is is gets points for coolness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. It, and like, the fact, and the fact that we might see space tourism from, say, Cornwall soon. Yeah. Uh, out of Newquay Airport. So, I mean, that, that that's pretty cool. The um, there's other space tourism started up again on the Soyuz. So Soyuz took people up. Well, it took uh, Yasuka Mazawa up for a start off. Um, and yeah. So. It, 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 it started space tourism up again. And, of course, (laughs) this year we had the first feature-length fiction film filmed in space by um, Kim Shapenko and Yulia Persil as well. That was in October, called called The Challenge. Is that entirely filmed in space? Yeah. Wow. Or a bit of it's filmed in space, but it's the first. Yeah. And uh, Wang Yaping, the first Chinese film astronaut to perform a spacewalk. That's exactly right. So yeah, so uh, Wang Yeping, who was one of the nineteen in space simultaneously, she also was the first female astronaut, Chinese female astronaut, to do a spacewalk, putting them, her in a very exclusive club of spacewalkers. Mm. Mm. Um, there we go. Um, I thought I'd finish the year uh, roundup, George, because I mean, it has been an amazing year for space. Um, I thought I'd finish the year roundup with crazy Russians. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because they seem to be doing everything to bring down the ISS. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you, uh, might, you, might, you might be building up a conspiracy theory here well but now you say that it, it's yeah, like they no, have, no, yeah, this year literally, they've done three, there's literally been three attempts you know, three ac- att- accidents yeah. you know a- accidents <laughs> three attempts to, to doom the uh, the iss i don't the, you can't really dub them attempts so they are officially speaking all accidents yes but the the nauka no nauka when it when it uh, docked with the ISS, that managed to sort of switch on its rocket thrusters and started spinning the ISS. And the only reason it stopped was because it ran out of fuel. It literally they couldn't shut the engine down. Sus. And, it sta- sus. and it started spinning the ISS. You know, there's a video game about imposters in a spaceship. Ah, uh, what is it called? Uh, don't worry. Um. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so Naoka started spinning the ISS. It was clearly really dangerous for all the astronauts. That was a major incident, I would I would say, that they played down hugely. Yeah, that is it is insane hearing about that. But uh, and it was uh, it was only because it took ages to get to the ISS and burnt up loads of its fuel that presumably it wasn't more serious. I mean, I, everything you think about that is just crazy, right? Yeah, it, it rotated several times. Oh my god, it just. 
Yeah, and and they were told to get away from the hatches because they were really scared. That and the... by the way, if if there's like just slight amount of area uh, of vibrations and things like that, the the solar panels that are really flimsy can just snap off. <laughs> and if that happens, they have no power to power like their oxygen supply. Oh, well, there must be batteries. So yeah, yeah. But... In, in other words, they've they, they've got to evacuate the ISS. It's game over yeah, for the it's ISS. Game... They, yeah. they either send up batteries well, really quickly. I reckon it's easy to knacker the ISS. And, oh, yeah. and that must have come close. But then not only that, they then sent a Soyuz MS-18, and that did the same thing again. It inadvertently fired its thrusters and changed the orientation of the ISS. But that wasn't news because the now Orca one had been so more ridiculous. But I'd never heard of that second one. No, no, I know. But, but, but that would have been big news had it not been for the now Orca one before. But And then on November the 15th, they went and blew up a satellite <laughs> that um, that caused at least one thousand five hundred pieces of wreckage. That was intentional, right? That yeah. Was. So yeah, but they intentionally blew up a satellite that then all the people on the ISS were told to get into the you know to 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 get into the um, evacuation ships <laughs> because it, it actually threatened to to crash in these like bits of space junk threaten the ISS and will do for a long time. That probably would cause World War Three if if that actually. No, I don't think someone. it'd cause World War Three because it would it would just go down as this is a crazy. Because remember the Russians are investing in the ISS as well. It, if the Chinese did it, I, I think it would be pretty dicey. Yeah, well, there are Chinese world... people on the ISS. No, no, there's not. Chinese no. aren't Chinese aren't allowed on the ISS. No, I th- really ever yeah, ever. Oh, yeah, of course they're building another one, right? They're well, building. Well, 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 we already know there's three on the Chang'ong. Yeah, yeah. But they're not because America is refuses to refuses to work with China in space. It, it's let by by law because of the risk of losing intellectual property, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I think. Um, but, Surely that the the Cold War with Russia, recent end of the Cold War with Russians. Yeah. Surely should like put them at, at slight, slight like skepticism towards them as well, or is it, or are they just too much of a bigger player? I, I, I don't know what it is, but I think it's because the Americans don't want their seek. They don't trust the Chinese with intellectual property, basically, because right. uh, on international law, I think. And so, so like the Americans won't work with the Chinese in space, which which means that Chinese have gone and often built their own, you know, built their own space station. And 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 the Chinese are willing to work with the Europeans. So the Europeans have been training on the on Chang'ong. Including Matthias Maurer. Matthias Maurer might actually be might actually be one of the only people that goes to the International Space Space Station and the Chang'ong, and then maybe even to the Lunar Gateway. How cool would that be? And he's one of the nicest get people chip, ever. Get to tick off all of your bingo. Yeah, that bingo is proper. I mean, that's a proper good collection there, isn't it? So yeah, so the Russians managed to try and bring bring down the ISS three times, and to add insult to injury, get this Rogozin. The head of Roscosmos on Twitter called my friend Eric Berger <laughs> a war criminal. <laughs> like literally on Twitter. It's like, what the hell? Very, very crazy. Crazy days. Um, but yeah, what a year. What the time to be alive. <laughs> Reference to reference of two minute papers if yeah. you ever want to watch a really good YouTube channel on on AI. Hold on recommend. to your papers. Hold on to your papers. A, a fantastic, fantastic uh, YouTube channel. Thanks, George, for, for introducing me to that. But it's uh, yes, there we go. That's it, George. What, what do you think of what do you think of the Cra- ra- crazy year for space? It has been a crazy year for space, and it's been a crazy year for the Spodcats. Thank you very much, Spodcats, for supporting the podcast. You'll get a big shout out on the New Year show. Uh, but for now. Make sure to subscribe to the Patreon. Yeah, subscribe to the Patreon. So if you want to know more about the Interplanetary Podcast, www.interplanetary.org.uk or nip over to patreon.com forward slash interplanetary and join the Discord with all the with all the Spodcats. We watched the uh, launch together. Yeah. Me and the German Spodcats. <laughs> Malte and Sven. The top, the top uh, donators. They are top donators. Great, great guys. The two Justins have been my top donators of all time. They're the greatest human beings on, on Earth. Uh, but yes, yeah, so uh, there'll, there'll be a proper Patreon shout-out next week. Uh, um, in the meantime, I hope you've had a lovely, lovely seasonal break. 
or Christmas break as it's known in the it UK. I hope it was seasonal. I hope it was seasonal. And uh, see you next week. Bye, bye. bye. bye.